Hello, Project people. Welcome to the final episode of season two of the Project Chatter podcast. I'm Val Matthews, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Dale Fung. Hey, Val. How's it, folks? What a season it's been, Val. Yeah, thanks, Dale. And uh, just a reminder to listeners to hit subscribe on that subscribe button or watch whichever platform you listen to your good podcasts on or YouTube channel for bonus bits. On this episode, we're going to cover lessons learned or knowledge management and why it's such a struggle for so many organizations. Well, why is it? I mean, let's jump straight in there, Val, because I, I've, I've heard quite a few webinars this year where people are talking about lessons learned or as we like to call it, lessons shared. And yeah. um, it's, it's still a struggle. I mean, you'd expect that perhaps with AI and better tool sets that it gets better, but there's, there's this element of um, one is, is data and collection of data, but also this experience of, of, um, of, of sharing these lessons. So it's a really tough one, actually, because unless you've lived it and experienced yeah. it, it's really difficult to convey what the lessons are. Um, and, but let's start yeah. with the tools because we like to start, you know, people process technology. <laughs> <laughs> let's start with technology, right? Because I, I know oh. you love that as well. Um, and, yeah. and we got, as we've mentioned before, you've got the, the, the end plans and then innate, innate trying to, you know, uh, you use, uh, lessons on past, uh, projects through machine learning, etc. Um, if we explore that space this year has, has the tool set become better for lessons learned or shared as we're calling it? I, th I think it's become, I think it hasn't. Well, it depends. Okay. We're generalizing obviously because yeah. every industry is different. Every project's unique in some endeavor, but the, the premise of it, I mean, I think if you, if you take a project controls expo as a, as a, as a marker of how many software companies or software as a service companies are out there promoting uh, products that can uh, retrieve and recall information, which is effectively what knowledge management is or lessons learned, uh, then and business must be good, but then if you see that conversion on the client side or the contractor side, the application of it isn't quite there. So I don't know how to answer that, whether it's getting better or not, <laughs> Dale. Uh, I'm pretty much on the fence. I'd like to say yes, because I'm optimistic uh, well, at heart. Well, I was going to say, you know, no matter how great the, the tool is, right, shit in, shit out, or as Paul Gooch loves to say, garbage in gospel yeah. arts right and i think that's what you're alluding to, <laughs> alluding to is that yeah, if in a the, nice way yes <laughs> if the information going in is isn't is, is substandard right yeah. the information coming out isn't going to be great either so so i guess that's the first point to say is we should we should actually really be concentrating if organizations really want to learn lessons from their past mistakes they should really focus on the the quality of the data that they're capturing for the future right so how might we exactly. get better at that though i mean well, let's I think, think about the, the last thing you want to do when you're closing out a project go okay what's everything we did and we have to put it in um it should be part of the embedded processes as you you know delivering the project that you should be capturing these but it's not well most projects have some type of quality gating or quality assurance or some type of phase gating where they should be capturing this and say, great, this is, this is good stuff. How do we capture it? And, and unfortunately, if we don't capture it when it's fresh in people's minds, that's when you lose the best parts of it. And the bits you miss are not necessarily the information. And I gave a similar presentation to um, Project Controls Expo around the importance of data. But if you just capture information, Dale, like, then that's great. Like you've caught, you've caught it. And it might be meaningful for you and everybody in that team and you high five and you say, yeah, we got the information. You lock it in and it's a bit like a time capsule. And then, you know, two weeks, two months, two years down the track when someone wants to pull that time capsule out and make sense of it, they need something else and it's called context. And that's what knowledge is. And so when I talk about data, like data is kind of the, the basis of it and you string data together and make meaning of it, then that's information. And then once, once you have information, then you need to contextualize it and that's knowledge. And then the final piece of that pyramid is, it's a triangle as well, Dale, is uh, wisdom, which comes from articulating uh, decisions from knowledge, right? So you, you get the knowledge, then you contextualize the information, which is the meaning, then you can make a smart decision. And the challenge is going to be, obviously, when you've got all this information that you all high-fived about before, it's not contextual. 
And so it's very, very hard to then apply that to the future projects or whatever you're storing the information for. So I think there's a, there's a long way to go in maybe in the systems and the software piece as well. And I don't know about you, Dale, but also in the process, how do you link that back? And I always think of it as a memory function, retrieve and recall, retrieve and recall. So every information that's stored has to have a contextual meaning. Mm. And um, that gives it, a, you know, this knowledge management bracket. Otherwise, when you recall it, uh, you're just recalling information that could be could be useful, or you probably get the so what. I say so. We uh, we change the design route to do X Y Z. And it's like okay, great. Why do we do that? And and what's what's the context in around around which you change that design? For example, so that, that there needs to there needs to be some some gating processes. And I think maybe the knowledge management or the lessons learned has been more about kind of public fact sheets or uh, promotional pr material rather than uh, factored as a, as a data set to be applied to future projects, which, which makes it, makes it more difficult. I guess it's up to the arbitrators or the, 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 per, the people that are monitoring, controlling, uh, I guess that's project controls, isn't it? Dale? Damn it. <laughs> One more job for us. Damn it. So to make sure that they, they archive correctly. And, and I said in this, uh, this presentation, I said, you know, not storing data without meaning and context is kind of like negligence to the future. Uh, because it's it's kind of wasted wasted effort. Uh, I don't know what your opinion is of it, but that's another triangle for, for everyone listening. No, we love the triangles, and it's great because yeah, we can yeah. we can state as many triangles as we want. I mean, no guest today. Mm. It's 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 us, um, you know, and raw. Um, raw, informal, hopefully informative as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I I agree with you. Uh, and for many parts, when we look at data, right. We, we think purely just facts and figures, okay? Mm. But what you're talking about, con context, that's not often captured in lessons learned, right? Yeah. And then that, that, that other element of um, storytelling, you don't really capture that mm. in lessons learned. And so that got me thinking, do we have to become more creative writers to um, convey uh, our experiences? Because sometimes it's not facts and figures it's 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 how people felt about something or you know um behaviors or com okay communication might be factual but there's also a style of communication that may or may not come through a style of leadership that may or may not help future projects but yeah. then that got me thinking while you were speaking perhaps they've got to do what we're doing recording voice recording mm -hmm. video so that mm -hmm they can play that back. But then also what we're doing on the Project Shadow podcast is transcribing so that you can then make that data searchable for future projects and relevant with, you know, um, metadata and tagging and, and, and et cetera. So you may go, mm. okay, well, I'm going to this type of construction project. I'm gonna build a, a new hospital in this type of location. What is another similar hospital in a similar type of location and circumstance? And you say, retrieve and recall. They're the videos or the voices I can listen to. And I can actually feel what the people went through working on that project previously. I don't know. That, that Those were some of my thoughts coming through on, on Lessons Learned. Yeah. But again, we're talking about the, the, the capture piece up front first. And how mm -hmm. many people are camera ready? How many people are willing to go in front of the camera and say, this This is the shit that went wrong, guys. Don't do this again. And this is what we did to make it right. That's a, that's a good point. So sometimes we're inhibited by ourselves, the ego, and, and the ramifications of being honest on projects. And I guess that's not going to stop when it comes to the lessons learned and, and capture management of knowledge that, yeah, okay, that's probably going to distort it somewhat. And then how do you know who's verifying that, that knowledge as well. So there's, it's kind of a tricky one, um, but you've got to, you've got to understand what you're trying to capture as well. I think if you, if you do go, I think you add another level of complexity when you say, take the storytelling as an example, which is a really good idea because that's contextual and not everything is quantitative, but then, um, you know, when it comes to storing that information, how do you then retrieve it? And I guess there is, there is tools out there. Like if you're looking at natural language processing and, and AI can read social language, which is relatively good, actually, uh, then in the future, it's probably not going to be a big issue. Um, but it is still how you categorize it and, and 
what under what scenarios under what pressures because as you know um what they call it clickbait it's very easy to make something sound like something else or yeah. look like something else with a bit of a flick of some edits and a bit of dubbing you can make something sound completely different contextually so yeah i think management and mismanagement of information over time is going to be a problem i think it is in general uh you just think about how you get your daily news like how do you get your facts now dale like do you watch the news do you read the newspaper where do you go for credible sources of information now you would think within a organization yeah, especially a private a for-profit organization that that information and intellectual property would be relatively sound but i'd argue the same point that that probably is going to be distorted by the fact that some mistruths don't want to be documented in real time like video and audio <laughs> <laughs> and so those contributions are are pretty irrelevant as well so it's almost like a court of law you want things to be able to stand up under under scrutiny and we used to call it uh you know auditability didn't we yeah we said well if it's not auditable then we should be doing it um and if it's not auditable we should be doing it that was kind of our two discussions we had with our teams working together i remember uh but i'd like to talk as well about the contribution types and there's three that i i think of i think of knowledge as capital like it's a type of value and it does translate into that and there's human capital there's organizational capital and informational so the, th the three of them somehow have to be categorized verified and stored in a medium that everyone can consume triangle so if you're a startup <laughs> yeah is it well, i was thinking more of a things. flywheel but yeah <laughs> I did see it. damn it this damn triangle uh so so if you're in a startup and you're agile videos and audio probably works if you're a scaled organization with three and a half thousand employees across multiple countries then then maybe that won't be the way you would retrieve information but utilization of those learnings is the other the other issue so once you've stored it and you've and you've got it contextually, you know, in a place where you think it's good, then the retrieving bit is the bit that seems to be not linked to any linear process. So you would assume that, let's say, lessons learned on your schedule, your plan, should carry forward. Uh, but unless they're linked to the, the plan carried forward, they're lost. Because by the time you retrieve them through a gate, you know, for argument's sake, I think mm. you've, you've, missed, you've missed the point. So there's, there's some structural dilemmas, I think. What would be really good if we're going to go futuristic like you were starting to paint the picture? It'd be great to have something like an AI Watson and you said, righto, Watson, uh, what did we do that was completely stupid on last project that we should be aware of right now? And then, you know, Watson would go and figure out what was contextually important for that period and go, well, these are the things that came up. You know, I recommend we do this, 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 and this. I mean, that's where I want to get to. And I think we're pretty close from the tools perspective we're still focusing on tools mm -hmm. but what's 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 harder than tools is is demonstrating how do you take bias out of it how do you take um distortions and generalizations out of it how do you categorize for contextual value um they're the things that i think we're going to struggle with because we're human right everything we do paints a bias view uh, well, no, i don't I'm think human. you can have I don't know about you i try I certainly try to assimilate with the rest of you, but, <laughs> but it is difficult and it's difficult because, uh, we don't like to be wrong, especially in front of others. I think that's important. Um, we, we want social proof and we want to be, we want to be, uh, on the right team, which yeah. is, a another interesting point of view. So if you obviously, you know, it's a bit like a jury, you know, it has to be unanimous, whatever you put into this time capsule. <laughs> so, well, does it though? Does it? Cause well, how do you, how do you break them apart? Well, you, the thing you, is, yeah. So, yeah. Sorry to interrupt your flow there, but no, I was no, no, thinking while you're, while you're chatting that the whole, um, data validation part, whether it's facts and figures or someone's account of what happened, right? You and I might be involved in the same uh lessons learned episode on the project let's call it that okay mm. but you will see and feel it differently than i would and so then whose view goes on and is captured in this audio or, or this video mine or yours right who validates that so mm. 
I might have a very painful experience and show the agony and, you know, it was really, you know, but where you might go, actually, it was quite an easy thing to do. And so don't worry about it too much, you know, because these are the facts and figures, they might be the same, but contextually for you, it's what, don't worry about it too much. But for me, it's like, you really need to worry about this. So then who validates that? And then it goes into, well, what my thinking goes into, you know, how we get three point estimating up front. Do we have three points mm. of view for the same lessons learned and shared? And then who has the time to go through all of that and then pick it up? This is, this is, I think what, what's, it's a discouragement. So if you think about humans, we like the path of least resistance, at least in projects, right? This might be different somewhere else. <laughs> at least my observation is it's like, if it's too difficult, we're naturally going to go around it or under it or over it. And when we when we even hypothesize what what's happening with knowledge management and how you get lessons learned even you and i are thinking like okay yeah right there's more to it right and i kind of paint it like this the iceberg theory because there's two types really there's explicit and that's what you're talking about there's there's explicit stuff that we can touch that's real that we all observe like if there's a red chair in front of us you and i would see a red chair hopefully yeah. maybe it's maroon but it's relatively close right so we have a a, rel a relative common understanding of reality something like that but then <laughs> then there's implicit or tacit knowledge like so it's, it's kind of under the surface and that's knowledge of the experience of the existing of the existing people so what you're saying about what, what they see in here and and which one's validated and verified that's a lot harder and it's harder to then express that in text sometimes you know if you take someone who learns a few languages some words don't translate at all so they're their model of the world is completely different and their experience of that world is completely different. So you have to go down to say, well, do we do the opposite? Do we look for the, the complete explicit, the things that are physically in front of us. And it's like, well, no, you can't because sometimes the things that ruin projects aren't in front of us. Um, they're the things that can't be seen like a really poor culture. And, and we talked about this as well, or poor people management can exit talented the people from the business and cause a massive disruption to productivity All right that's that's proven mm -hmm. and and how do you therefore put that in lessons learned and when does that occur exactly as a lessons learned so at the start of the project well that'd be a, a preemptive kind of uh a preventative if you like or is it something you do later on just to check how do you measure that you know you, so you've got to really think about the application of tacit knowledge and where you would apply lessons learned for that too i think explicit knowledge is being used like i think innate uh, has a as a has a tool set basis which talks about the estimation phase and also the kind of the AI piece learning and applying future lessons into the schedule so it can predict effectively what or at least prescribe maybe in the future what a, a future schedule should look like if you've got repetitive projects but it gets very gray when you start to talk about the things that we're talking about now which is the with the, the tacit or the implicit stuff yeah yeah no I I agree it's a fascinating thing um it's it, it it's such a tough space it it, it really is even, even just talking about it you're going yeah there's all these ver various ways that you could capture lessons there's all these various ways you could tell stories we've spoken about the art of st storytelling as well um i'm then beginning to think well okay um as you as you mentioned uh when are they captured if they're captured in the beginning throughout the end um that goal all goes into something whether <laughs> whether that when i say the something the tool the data set whether that's in a video form or um audio or, or, or just text uh who knows but then i'm thinking how do you then select whether it's appropriate for this new project that you're about to go into how do you because mm. and, I, and and i always bring it back to the very basic definition of a project right a project is a unique endeavor with a definite start and a definite end and because it's unique not all lessons are applicable so how do you then sift through all yeah. of that data and i think you're alluding to it there as well um that is really tough to go okay well this project and this project might look the same on the surface but actually only 50% of the lessons on that one can be transferred and learned on this one. But how do you know which 50? Yeah. You know, <laughs> you, you yeah. don't just select them um, because, no. and then, okay, so perhaps, and 
maybe not, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing here, your uh, construction projects perhaps might be a bit easier because, you know, construction to construction. But if you're working in development, software development, for example, huge software development projects, I don't know, perhaps creating uh, control systems for a nuclear submarine or something like that, right? Um, mm. How do you then say, okay, well, what other control system can I use? Can I use one from an aircraft carrier? Yes or no? Uh, you know? Um, yep. yep. And because you're in development of software, it, it's so complex. Is this complex or complicated? <laughs> uh, it's a little bit of both. I think it is, isn't time. it? <laughs> uh, I, th I think it's complicated by the fact that, I mean, most industries don't share knowledge anyway, but there is a, there's a bounds in which we haven't actually d really discovered the value of, you know, cross-sharing information. Like the, the, they're so isolated. If you take transport infrastructure, let's say, and you say the defense of, uh, of shipbuilding, the submarines as an example, then there would be commonalities between certain build types. Not everything. But there'd be certain things that that would cross over might be how we wire or terminate a box um it might be something we do at the reporting level you know it might be something that we could learn from from both of them and it's especially especially for the implicit uh, those that relate to uh people's experiences and their competencies etc uh you could certainly do them across any type of project but it, it it's almost like you know if you think about explicit implicit behavior and and knowledge it's 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 habitual it's 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 the way we embed knowledge as well so i think if anyone normal was, was thinking about this and anyone was being interviewed i think the normal thing to say if anyone was asking would be well i would create a template and then that template i'd have metadata and then i'd get everyone to fill in that data and then i put it in a database and then i would link that database to major phases for each group type based on some type of qualifier or you make them read, you know, anything related to design at the design stage, and anything related to software at the software development stage. You know, examples. So, but that that simple answer just doesn't work, and I haven't seen a consistent or any uniform lessons learned approach across any any project I've ever worked for. Some of them are good at keep keep keeping kind of a kind of a highlight page, like a one pager. This is what we did good. This is what we did okay. Or you know, some information about who was involved, the context of when it happened and how it happened um, and what we did about it, something like that. And then others will have just a big drop list in Excel with a whole bunch of meta fields or maybe it's SharePoint and you'll just go and search for those lessons um, at a predetermined time. Uh, both of them for me don't feel like the end result of a lessons learned. They mm. feel like uh, they're part of a routine but don't don't work across the board. So you might get project controls doing it. You might get PMO doing it. You won't get engineering doing it. Sorry, I'm picking on the engineers today. Uh, or they'll have their own versions of the truth, you know, like you said before. So I, I do think this is where one of those things or one of those conversations where you could say, could, could machines make it better? And the answer is undeniably yes, because they can take vast amounts of information uh, based on some parameters. So some qualifiers and provide us with um the truth faster let's call it that so yeah. i actually think one of the areas that machines could do a really good job for us lazy humans and forgetful humans is is around this retrieve and recall function and uh correlation but it doesn't mean that they're always going to infer the right information because there, there's still a human touch that's required so i think it's pretty far off you'd need some some pretty smart guys on that to train a machine to pick up the nuances in not just the storytelling, but the data mm. and then to correlate the data to the stories and then to correlate the times and the whens and hows and all the other factors, you know, how do you, for example, how do you factor in COVID as a lessons learned on a major project? Wow. Cause yeah. it's a kind of, it's a, it's a black it's swan out, type it, event. Yeah. It's an outlier, right? But it, you know, so you go lessons learned, you know, don't work in construction because you know, when lockdown happens, no one can work on anything. <laughs> <laughs> unless kind unless you're in the design lesson. phase perhaps and you're working on computers still exactly exactly <laughs> you just prolong design <laughs> yeah no agree and just gold plate it. you you bring up a interesting point though around capturing and i was thinking then that if if capturing is 
hugely important to make it successful, right? Capturing of data and information up front. How many projects actually factor in estimates and account for time required for people to input data um, for lessons learned? And as you say, if it's everyone's um, responsibility to input mm. their lessons learned, whether you're the engineer, um, the, the person on site, the controls person, the planner, whoever it is, if it's everyone's role, then surely a, a portion of our time needs to be factored in, which increase costs and potentially increase headcount, which companies don't want. So in, a, in fact, you're thinking then, well, organizations, because you want to keep your headcount low, um, but this data that will improve your profitability going forward will come from resources, human resources. Yep. Isn't it yep. counterintuitive then to try and limit? Um, I don't know. It, uh, that, that was a fascinating, from my, from my perspective, is you got to invest uh, where you want to improve. And if it's in lessons learned so that you can be more profitable going forward, then perhaps you do need those additional resources rather than trim it down from 20 to 15 or whatever the case may be. I'm not sure if it's additional. I think it's replacing some redundant resources where we've had in the past. So if the observation, if I take an observation today, we talk about data engineers. Yep. You could, you could take that to the next step and you could say, well, maybe in the future we have knowledge engineers and data engineers are kind of just, you know, not required because the machines build the systems that build the tools that build the knowledge bases that we need. And we need knowledge engineers to extract and help train machines to give us insights on projects. So I think but there's, you still a, need, there's a challenge. You, you, sorry, you, you still need someone to input the data. So if I'm the engineer and I'm working on the project and as I'm going, I know that, I don't know, perhaps two hours a week, I have to, at the end of the week or start whenever, two hours a week, I have to put in what I've learned that week on anything that may have gone wrong or particularly well. Okay. Yeah. If you yeah. add all of that time up, either it's going to push your project out or you're going to say, well, to keep those time scales, I, I need additional heads. That's just simple maths. So you still, uh, yeah. so I, I, I'm not even talking about the capturing bit of the technology. I'm talking about the input bit of the capturing. Mm. Mm. You're, you're considering transaction. I mean, I guess the, the workload doesn't change in the future, which would be, hopefully it does. Like designs shouldn't take the same amount of time they do today in yes, two years, three years, correct. five years. They shouldn't. They, they shouldn't. should be less. But that's Maybe not what we're seeing, because... I don't think. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm not saying they won't. Uh, but the idea is we, we always get better, faster, cheaper or something along those lines. So, you know, if... If, if we're still playing the future game, because I like that, if we're still playing with AI Watson, Mr. Watson uh, notices that your designs had three mods and says, what's going on? And gives you a prompt on your screen and starts recording straight away. So Dale, you've had the modifications to your design. This is highly unregular or irregular, probably better grammar. Uh, what happened? What went wrong? What are you doing about it? And it recorded the text and transcribed that and then added it to the knowledge base for validation through a workflow that went through a smart contract, which was blockchain, um, which was then was approved by whoever's on the approval list. Um, and that How comfortable done. will you be with Big Brother watching your work, though? Well, when you say Big Brother, what do you mean? You mean like so if I'm, if I'm a designer in 1984? Or? Yeah, let, let's say this. <laughs> you know, it's great to go into the future because, um, you know, it can be anything. But let's say we've got this system, let's, let, let's call it IBM's Watson, right? And the work ongoing on the project is being recorded constantly to pick up on lessons learned and look for trends and perhaps apply lessons from previous projects if they notice a similar um, trend happening here. But if I'm working as a designer, say, right, um, how comfortable will, will I be knowing that all of my stuff ups are being recorded? You see what I mean? From the human aspect. Uh, personally, yep. I, I'd be okay with it because I, I'm, I'm open to, we're not perfect, fail forward, fail off and fail fast. I, I'm happy with that because that's how you learn. But as you alluded to earlier, people want to be on the winning side. They don't want to necessarily mm. air their dirty laundry, so to speak. And so how comfortable will the average person be on saying, well, everything that I'm doing now 
is being recorded. Yeah. Well, the younger generation have certainly captured, you know, my uh, observations when it comes to privacy laws and how flippant they are about putting everything online for the whole world to see forever, right? Yeah. Any Twitter post, any Instagram photo, anything on TikTok, anything on YouTube, including us. Uh, so, so I think it's the, it's the old school, let's say that the guys that grew up without the internet and we're probably the last generation, I would say, uh, who would only, would be, would be the ones that would be struggling with it. I think you could comfortably say that the, the ones that grew up with this kind of public profile and like an online profile and a, and a, and a physical profile are used to having the two mediums and thus being recognized by some type of algorithm that, you know, you've done something unusual against the plan they'd be accepting. I think we've got to come to peace with the fact that we can't slow machines down and we're eventually integrating at a ridiculous rate. Like it's pretty crazy. And the only thing stopping us is, is our inability to have that psychological safety um, with machines. It's like even, so as you said, you're a scenario there, you're quite right. Like, okay, so let's say the machine doesn't pick it up and the engineer continues to tell us everything's on time as he works on the third one. Yeah, I could still make that end date. Uh, if we had any type of analysis on it, it would tell us that they're going to run late, but we don't find out to the end. So what happens is this has a knock on effect, as you know. So there's this dependency logic knocks on various other project activities. Now, if this is on a grand scale, that project could knock on other projects. If it's on a grand, grand scale that could blow out the budget for a public project or a rail project by billions. We've never heard that before, but that could happen. And so what ends up happening is everyone pushes it to the right everyone no one wants to deal with it and i think that way of managing projects is really ineffective and i think there's there's an opportunity for us to kind of allow machines to guide the way on some of these processes now knowledge management should be should be one of them and there's some challenges to it i don't think it's perfect but we're, we're future escaping this a little bit which is fun um you know engineers might be okay with it uh maybe pmo isn't maybe finance isn't who knows it could be anyone but there's there's four main challenges that, that we need to address there's there's the challenge around education which also is the challenge around acceptance of machines there's the challenge of storage so where are we going to put it all and particularly on like uh, challenging contracts where you got alliances like ppps public private partnerships don't have a common data environment so where do you start for lessons learned mm. when proprietary information intellectual property is yours you're working on this on a project together yeah you are but still my still my information still my value so there's that uh governance obviously that's all around the bit you talked about validation verification how you control those those governance pieces the processes and the routine so how do you get them into the habitual behavior of actually submitting uh lessons and then there's the systems which is what we're talking about now so what systems what systems are there to help us make things easier? Like a car, a car makes it easier for me to travel around. It's not meant to replace anything at all. Um, it's, it's a vehicle. And so we need to understand how we, how we get the vehicles to work in the right direction. Mm. But if you, if you've got autonomous vehicles, like what's the big deal if they're safe and they get us from A to B quicker, surely then that alleviates us from having decision fatigue on doing low value transactional work and we can kind of take up that strategic space and go, okay, well, if all that's being taken care of now, I can focus on the really important stuff. And if you had that little AI assistant on the side bar there, like a Siri or a, or a Watson or a whoever it is, uh, then, then wouldn't that make you a little bit more secure in your role? So you could say that design engineer you were talking about earlier could say, oh shit, you're right. Third third modification what's going on has this happened anywhere before and they said well actually we did this on the last project oh who was that that was john all right i'm gonna call john you know whatever it is john what did you do about this well blah blah blah, blah. so i think i don't want to tell anyone i think physical interactions are still important that's why i put yeah. that last bit in there yeah the physical piece is still important pick up the phone or go see someone you know we used to do it a lot walk up the stairs go sit down at someone's desk i think that's still valuable massively but the, the response piece, the retrieval piece should be something that's almost innately part of the system. Mm. Uh, 
I think that'd be really, really fun. Well, it's fascinating though, because what you're alluding to is where um, these days, if you want anything that you don't know, what do you do? You Google it. Hmm. So you actually want to um, take that Google behavior onto projects. Yeah. To, to, because for the most part, when you're in your role on a project, you, you, you honestly believe in your capabilities and you believe that, you know, you, you know what you're doing, but there's an element in all of us that actually don't know what we're doing in certain times. And that's that, yeah. that Google mentality where you got to go, actually, let's go ahead and seek out and do validate. Do we know what we're doing? Right. Be vulnerable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's not just a leadership quality. I think everyone should be vulnerable to a certain extent, but it starts with leaders, but we won't go into that. But then if we're still going with a future vibe and, and let's, let's continue with it. Right. And your hero um, <laughs> gets what he wants and we all got chips inserted into our brains, Elon Musk. And um, I brought it up this time, not you. Um, and no, good. <laughs> but I was thinking along these lines and we all get chips inserted into our brains. And so lessons learned or captured, uh, and then shared in the future become easier because these microchips are not only capturing our thoughts and, and data, but also um, capturing the chemical interactions that are going on in our body. So they're understanding the emotions we've gone through and all of that. But then that goes into machine learning and machines can build other machines and then eventually replace humans. And then we're all doomed. Um, that's, I don't know, that's hectic future stuff. But then I was also thinking, what if yeah. we just go totally opposite and go, you know what? let's not concentrate on lessons learned at all and just focus on getting the best experts right with the knowledge to build a project am, am, am i talking shit? tell me no, <laughs> i'm no, just no, i'm just no, throwing no, out no. there i'm just challenging the total opposite just go we're struggling so much with lessons learned let's just forget about it let's not waste our time I'm just trying to be devil's advocate here and throw something totally left yeah, field well that's that's the cynic in me as well like the, you know if you if you rely too much on, on machines that there, there is a lax in competence and i think we've seen on a lot of projects that that, that education is a, a huge challenge so when you say experts you know you're assuming a certain amount of years in the field or um a, cer a certain level of experience on certain types of projects mm -hmm. that would qualify them as experts now which we do which we do have today yeah but my point being yeah. is, should we then still rely on lessons learned, you know? Well, I think the idea was that it's a knowledge distillation process. So the idea was that you take the information from someone who's an expert and you transfer it to someone who's not. And that distillation process is actually something you do in knowledge management. And uh, so you, let's say you take the experience someone's take, had, right? If, they, if it's an implicit experience, there'll be explicit parts to it, but they'll try and summarize as best they can or distill some type of wisdom, right? Hopefully it's contextual. Hopefully it's got meaning. You know, they've got that template we talked about with all the metadata, they filled in their SharePoint or Excel. That lesson, that's the lessons learned. A, a lot of lessons learned would equal the best practice if it was within a niche field, let's say. Let's say it was rail project controls. Or better, you know, design engineering in project in, in rail on a CBTC program, really specific. Then a number of best practices would make a standard. So the knowledge distillation process should be from experience to standards. And the idea of that is not everyone could be an expert. Mm. Um, well, this actually then brings into what you and I spoke a lot about when we worked together is succession planning and how you have the experts yes. and then the next level down in their career and then next level to all the way through to your graduate or apprentice, right? And if you have that in place, well, then you have this sort of loop, or maybe it's not a loop, this distilling on, of information, as you're saying, f and future proofing. Well, mm. that that's assuming that, you know, <laughs> the people you're investing in will stay with your company, which doesn't happen that often these days. Um, but if you're investing then maybe that maybe they will be. And so that cycle happens. Mm. Um, where you, you are passing the data down, perhaps recycling and improving as, as you're passing it on. I don't know. Uh, and, and that, and that cuts out the, the computer bit and doesn't make future, future, uh, staff and employees less capable because you're actually passing the, the experience and ideas on to people rather than machines. 
to be honest, they've set the bar pretty low today. Like I, yeah. I say that with, with empathy as well. I, not enough people have passion in their profession. And so I think to be an expert, you need to exceed the bars of the standards. So let's say you take someone who's worked on projects for five years. So it's pretty significant in a particular field, let's say a particular sector. And they work from nine to five standard hours every day that they're employed to work. They take their leave when they're meant to take their leave. They do the work. It's of good quality. Uh, they listen, they, they have mentors, they have a traineeship that, you know, they have access to resources. They have this wonderful project chatter podcast, which is live free weekly, uh, at their fingertips, whatever else they'd like little plug. <laughs> You don't have to plug us, you know, because people well, I didn't are listening to, to it us. Just came out. It just came out so naturally. <laughs> I was just thought I'd keep going. <laughs> but what happens is that accumulation process isn't the same as someone like who grinds. And I'm not saying that everyone should go out there and work their asses off. But what I mean by grind, I don't mean grinder. I mean, go out and if you don't know the answer, you're back at home that night researching like a madman or woman trying to find ways to do things better. You come in with new fresh ideas the next day, you're pushing everybody else. That to me is someone who in five years, because of the hours extra that they're spending on the, on the problems and they're coming up with new innovative ways to tackle those problems, you know, freedom within a framework, they're still doing same work, but they're doing it with greater hours of investment. So they've got a passion for the profession and those people are the guys and girls that become experts. Yeah. And so the succession plan works to a point. But I think when you get to the tippy top, uh, those that don't have the passion will will become managers and probably be good managers. Like they'll become generalists and, and probably go up into the corporate ladder somewhere. Uh, but a very few will actually become experts and they usually understand the value of their worth and go out and do their own thing or they become a consultancy or you know become a contractor. And so it's it's very difficult to then contain those experts in the business. And I think the danger while not relying on systems and not using that knowledge distillation process is for me is that then we're relying on resources. And as you know, that becomes then a critical point of failure if they decide to leave. And we've had that on projects and I've had a lot of the really good guys basically holding up a very critical part of the project. This happens all the time. They're so good that everyone starts to rely on them and they're like, Oh, geez. Hero you know, culture. Yeah. Yeah. Hero culture. Right. They don't realize these guys will work weekends. They'll work, you know, 17 hours, but they've got such a good work ethic that they, and they care about what they do that everyone goes to them. They're the go-to guys. Everyone's got them, right? I used to call them pillars of influence because they might not have the stature or the title, but they can still influence change across the board, across the project. It doesn't matter what level. And that they're the problem then, because if that's the behavior we continue to foster, then when they, when they go to another job or we, we sack them because we're trying to save money on contractors. We've, we've lost, we've lost that knowledge. We've lost that lesson. It's not distilled anywhere, you know, because it's part of their IP as a contractor, they're not going to share that information. So, so I think the only challenge I have there is it's kind of a balance between what you're saying about resource experts and then distilling that knowledge to some degree to get a best practice or a standard that we can all kind of sort of climb to, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. I mean, it reminded me, I think it was Vin that left us with a quote, something along the lines of, you know, if you want to be extraordinary, you got to do uh, more than what everyone else expects mm. of you, right? And that's yeah. what you're alluding to, which is great. But I think what we're, what we're sort of coming to is that um, it's probably going to be a bit of a balance that's required between technology and human resources. And, and, and perhaps... Perhaps this pod is not going to give anyone any particular answers. Perhaps this is just going to provoke thought. You're going, how can we improve our own organization's lessons learned or lessons captured, learned and shared? And maybe that's what's got to be brought into it because people use this word flippantly, lessons learned, mm. but they don't really know what it means. And as you're saying, lessons learned is an every, it should be an everyday occurrence for each of us. Every day we should be learning something new. Um, yeah. Or maybe not. Maybe some people don't. Maybe some people don't want to be, you know, that, that expert. And that's okay too. 
right? We've yeah. spoken about this, our why stream that we, you know, we spoke about. Um, you, you, you get those that want to be exceptional, but you get those that, that don't want to be exceptional. They, they have other priorities. They come to work, they want to do their 95 and they want to go home and that's okay too. Um, mm. So it's, it's, quite, it's a really, really interesting concept. And, and like I say, perhaps we've just maybe opened a can of worms. Maybe we haven't, maybe we just, you know, poke the bear i don't know which uh <laughs> poke the bear away but I, I would i would like to say there is there is an iso standard for knowledge management as well it's iso 3401 if anyone wants to google it it, it will talk to you about two things that are really important there's practical knowledge and academic knowledge and i think if you're trying to get a certification you'll need to demonstrate those but if you're not sure where to go i think start with an iso standard and then look at your company's business processes and try to integrate the two and then understand like it's it's a journey so you're, you're you know if you haven't got a knowledge management system and you are looking at lessons learned uh less is more and build it over time get feedback again it's got to be valuable to the people that are retrieving it as well as the people that are uh, sending it you know if you're storing information just remember that it's for another audience it's not for yourselves uh but that's all i'd say on that dale anything else on knowledge management from you mate no i <sighs> Like I say, I, I think um, I think I, I, I think there's a lot to think about when it comes to lessons learned. And <laughs> we've certainly gone all over the show with this one, um, but yeah. it's been great as well because it's been a long time since it's just been the two of us just sharing our thoughts on on a particular topic. It has, it has, and yeah. In some ways, it's refreshing. But taking nothing away from the amazing guests that we've had, um, you know, this season and this year. And so maybe we should look back, Val, on some of the lessons learned on, on the Project Shadow podcast this year and share those. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's do it. So where do you want to start? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, we certainly grow, and I think both in terms of content and in terms of... Um, uh, the quality of um, uh, our uh, production of this podcast. Oh, without a doubt, you sound um, so much better. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> um, but but that's largely in part to our guests as well. And um, we we uh, were fortunate to get an amazing intern, Siri, as well. So shout out to her for for her help with all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but our sponsors, Val. Yeah, well, I think we should start there now that I've got the screen in front of me. Uh, we'd like to start thanking our sponsors. So Steve at JustDo.com, thank you so much. You're hilarious. You're a lot of fun, a lot of energy. Uh, appreciate all your time and support. Uh, you've been there from the start, so thanks for your help. Uh, and Plan Academy for your support as well and ongoing support. Michael, you're a fantastic superstar and a natural in front of the screen. Um, they're amazing companies to be associated with, and uh, we truly appreciate it. Um, if you think you'd like to become a sponsor for us in the next season, please do get in touch. We do have some available slots. Uh, obviously, we are doing this and paying this forward, uh, but it's such a great uh, initiative. And the feedback we've had from from you guys in the community has been overwhelming. So thanks for everyone. Thanks for your help. Yeah, no, I agree, Val. And, and on the Pay It Forward initiative, we, we do need to thank TRS Staffing uh, and the 4D Construction Group for supporting our Pay It Forward charity initiative. Um, We've managed to raise an amazing 800 pounds this year. I, wow. It sounds like a little, but in the context of things, I think that's amazing because yeah. a lot of people are struggling. Um, and so a huge thanks, thanks to both those those uh, organizations. And and obviously, you know, listeners and, and uh, viewers can continue to to help with that. They can visit our charity shop where all the, the proceeds go to towards charity. And to remind ourselves, we, we've... Um, we signal. Uh, I can't even talk. Uh, we've um, <laughs> singled out uh, charities that support children in need of education and fair opportunities in life um, as a pay it forward. So there's also a special thanks to um, two individuals that we'd like to to also um, give a shout out to, and that's Chirag Shah and Anil Gadavale. Um And and these two have been our advocates. They've involved us in in, in um, connecting us with other people. Uh, Chirag um, obviously is a recruitment specialist, um, but he knows so many people in the controls and 
project environment and he's put in touch with a lot of guests that we've had on the show um so thanks to him because that knowledge is now shared with you the listener um and then also annual through the controls expo and project controls online which you know we're looking to collaborate further on and so that support has been amazing and and um both those individuals um have a very similar uh ethos um and outcome for project chatter podcast mm. and that's to yeah. build a community and share expertise and last but certainly not least well our amazing experienced guests um absolutely without those guests i don't think you and i could have just done this alone we we've said it from the beginning we we're not experts right we think we know perhaps a, a lot about a little bit a little bit of a lot i don't know which way it is but um yeah the experts enough we've had dangerous. on exactly enough to be dangerous and yep. disrupt um but without our guests from all the way from really technical stuff like earned value and nec contracts through to some of the more softer skills involved in project management like leadership empathy storytelling culture um it's been amazing uh, but let's listen to some of the messages that our guests have sent through for you. Hello all, I was part of uh, the Project Chatter uh, podcast on uh, episode 45 in series two. Uh, my name is Brennan Lockett, I'm the CEO of Logical. Um, and I spoke about uh, our annual project control survey, which is out now, uh, and BIM during construction. I really enjoyed my chat with the guys, uh, both uh, Val and Dale and uh, on the podcast. It was just a good opportunity to sort of share our experience for the benefit of others. Uh, I think the guys are doing a fantastic job uh, creating a platform for, uh, for for all of industry, really, whoever wants to get involved to share their experience uh, for the benefit of, uh, of others as well, which is uh, which is fantastic. So, uh, so tune in or get involved in, in 2021. I think the world of infrastructure projects is changing uh, faster than we know it. So actually tuning into uh, uh, to platforms like this where you can learn about the future and what's coming, uh, what's working and what's not, uh, are great things to get involved in uh, to, to make sure we, uh, we, we all are successful in future. So make it a resolution and happy new years to all. Hi Dale, hi Val, this is Glenn Hyde from GMH Planning. I joined you back in episode 31 and we had a very interesting, lively debate about managing NEC contracts and how important they are to be managed. And maybe even got away with being slightly disparaging about earned value. But I think you were in agreement with the points I was making and how it isn't necessarily the be all and end all that some people seem to think that it is. Just like to wish you and your listeners a very happy new year for 2021. And maybe just leave you with the thoughts that NEC contracts are there to be managed and should be used. And in particular, Make sure that on every single period you have an accepted program and that every period you do, you do manage to get that uh, as to be in the case. So each program, every period should be accepted. So that should be your New Year's resolution for 2021. So all the success for you and all the listeners in the new year. Hopefully catch up with you again. Hi, my name is Caroline Patterson. I'm the Director of Strategy and Transformation for Blue Visions Australia. I got to join Dale and Val um, for season one, episode 19, where we talked about women in leadership and managing work-life balance. Uh, it was an absolute blast. And um, I've just got a quick message for you guys, just wanting to say this year's been really challenging, but we've gotten through it and we will get through the next year with whatever challenges it throws at us. And I guess my advice to you all is to look after yourselves to take the time out to live in the moment, to think about the joy that is in the now and not so much about what will come or what was and to go into this festive season, whether you celebrate Christmas or not, take the time out, be with your friends, be with your family and be present. I wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a safe new year. And I hopefully will um, see some of you in the new year. Take care. Bye. Hey, it's Chirag here from TRS Staffing. I was on the podcast, Series 1, Episode 24, where we discussed recruitment, interview tips, and the future. My experience with Val and Dale has been amazing, not just the podcast I was on, but helping to bring the Project Controls community together. I've really enjoyed this time in um, how we've managed to develop an extra following. On the podcast itself, I really enjoyed 
discussing recruitment and how I can help project control professionals. Also, how we finished up talking about our loves of whiskey. My message to you, if you're listening, next year is going to be good. As soon as we get out of COVID, the market is going to boom. And to be honest, the last few weeks have been one of the busiest ever for me recruitment wise. So if you're not happy in your job, you know, feel free to reach out to me for some career advice. I'm happy to help and advise you. As we head into 2021, with only a week or two left, happy new year and next year will be far better. Hi, I'm Karen Hurt. And I'm David Dye. We're from Let's Grow Leaders. And the authors of Courageous Cultures, How to Build Teams of Micro Innovators, Problem Solvers, and Customer Advocates. And we loved being on season two, episode 46 of Project Chatter. And as you enter in 2021, our tip is be the courageous leader you want your boss to be. Happy New Year, everyone. Hi, I'm Steve Wake. I'm an expert in earned value management, and I was with Dale and Val a couple of weeks ago on program 48, telling you about that at great length. My message to you for now and for 2021, quoting Robert the Bruce is, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Keep on keeping on. And remember, the stuff you do, you don't do it once, you want it to be done again and again and again. So become like status quo. Now, finally, for Christmas, perhaps you could join me in the EVA Panto and tell me where the snowman is. Have you seen him? I've looked over here. I've looked over there, but I can't see where the snowman is. So if you'd be kind enough, could you tell me where the snowman is, please? Have a great 2021. Bye bye. Hey, my name is Michael Lepage from Plan Academy. If you've been listening to Project Chatter podcast, you probably heard me being interviewed by Val and Dale on season one, episode 20, where we talked about Primavera P6, online training, and some stuff around Plan Academy. Not only that, Plan Academy sponsors the podcast. That's why we like it so much. And I'm looking forward to doing another episode soon. But my ask for you for 2021, is, it's just a small ask, but can we stop using the, like capitals so much? I see a lot of like Primavera P6 schedules and they're just, they're all in caps. You know, even I got this email from Dale just the other day, Val and I would like to say a massive thank you. And it's all in caps. It's just a little much. So just uh, stop with the caps so much. Happy holidays and happy new year from Plan Academy. Hi, I'm Stephen Gurevitz, the community manager at Just Do, justdo.com. And I was on um, uh, series two, I think, and episode 32. I'm reading it off a list because I can't remember, but there we go. And my experience of the podcast was that Dale and Val um, ask really good questions, have really good banter, and more importantly, really understand their subject. We're not talking about two generic presenters here. Um, my message to the listeners, it's been a tough 2020 for many of you, I'm hoping you will both in your personal and business lives have a very positive 2021 and come out of all of uh, the difficulties with some strength, purpose and uh, happiness. And something to think about heading into 2021, of course, as the community manager of Just Do, I will say, make sure that you and your colleagues are using the right tools for the right purpose so you're not making work harder than it has to be. Thanks for watching and Happy New Year. Bye bye. Hi everybody, Andy Morgan from Firstco. You can find me in Project Chatter episodes 15 and 30. Just must have done something right the first time they invited me back. Um, we all know it's been a very, very difficult year this year, uh, but through uh, adversity we find we find opportunity, through, through challenge we find solutions and innovations. So uh, I'd encourage everybody to think about the, the silver linings in the, the big black cloud that has been 2020 and think about what we've learned and what we've developed and how we've improved this year to solve the challenges that we can take into 2021 uh, to make things better or easier or safer for us all. Uh, I'd also like to wish all the all the listeners a, a happy new year and a safe, easier and much more prosperous 2021. Thank you. 
Howdy, howdy, howdy. I'm Dana Nguyen. I'm an actor, comedian, and I'm a joyful snorter. And I was interviewed on episode 34, talking about the art of storytelling and how to show up as yourself, your joyful self. And knowing the year that we have experienced in 2020, and if you haven't done it, my tip for 2021 is to breathe. I know, it's very simple, but by breathing and being present, then can you experience joy and then use joy to find out what you need to do to have joy in your life for the rest of your life. And that's what I've learned in 2020 in my own kind of being in the arts and in the industry where I got shut down. And I got to speak to the, the boys during COVID with a glass of wine and I, we had a great time talking and laughing about you know this weird kind of world we're in, but how we can keep persevering when we know what our story is and what brings us joy. I know, I'm just hammering about joy, but when you know it, it becomes so much clearer. Have a self, oh, have a self, <laughs> have a safe and wonderful break and leading to 2021, may you experience more life journeys. This life keeps continuing. It's not based on years. It's based on now. Bye. Hi. I'm Toby from Nplan, where we're applying AI technology to schedules. Our CEO, Dev, and I joined Val and Dale in Season 2, Episode 38. My advice for 2021 is to reflect on the past 12 months. I think it's fair to say that it's shown the importance of adoption of new technologies and new practices. So think about your sphere of influence, whether that's on your projects or within your organizations, and how you and continue to drive innovation. And with that, I'd like to wish you a very happy and safe New Year's and a very prosperous 2021. Hello everyone, I'm Al Godable, Project Controls Expo. I think I appeared in the session S2E37 where I introduced Project Controls Expo to the global project controls community. <clears throat> I think this year has definitely been a topsy-turvy for many, but what's important is that, uh, you know, we're coming out safe uh, and with a positive outlook at the end. I think 20, 2021 is going to be exciting with a lot of positive news going around, going around. I think we should all continuously work towards a development our profession uh, along with, of course, uh, most importantly, which is actually looking after ourselves, uh, looking after our family members and staying healthy and fine. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Hi, this is Paul Googe of Paul Googe Associates Limited. Um, I had the great joy of participating in episodes 21, 30 and 47. And frankly, they were just great fun. Um, great to share some really interesting insights, hear them from uh, fellow um, PCM professionals. Thanks to Dale and Val. You've done a great job. Um, the numbers are staggering. You've done really well with this. Um, a message? Well, I would say we've all learned a lot this year, haven't we? Or, or have we? There's an old saying about, no, never confuse 20 years experience with, with just one year repeated many times. And I hope we have learned and we haven't just repeated. So look, all the best to everyone for 2021. We've learned about ourselves. And remember, IQ will get you the job. EQ will get you promoted. All the best. Happy New Year. Bye. Hi there, it's Al Silvernight, Managing Director of the Advanced Consultancy. And hello to all you Project Chatter podcast listeners and viewers out there. Uh, just a quick message to wish you a happy Christmas and uh, good luck for 2021 after this challenging 2020. I had the uh, pleasure of working with uh, Val and Dale on uh, Series 1, Episode 13, Series 2, Episode 30, and recently a Series 2, Episode 47 with my friend and colleague Paul Gooch. Um, known uh, Val and uh, Dale for a while now, so uh, we're grateful for working with them. And after the challenge in 2020, then all I'd say to 2021 is just go out there and uh, investigate and be curious and challenge and disrupt and, uh, and listen and get those podcast headphones on, take a walk, go and listen to some of the great experiences and uh, authorities and interesting people that these guys have managed to bring together. So good luck and have a good Christmas. Well, great messages. Uh, yeah, it's great to hear from our previous guests and experts on everything. And what 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 theme seems to come out of it is this 
resilience. Obviously, 2020 was quite a year. We kicked off the, the Project Chatter podcast at the start of this year, and it was basically when COVID hit. And to see that there's still light at the end of the tunnel, that there's still cheer, that there's still determination for a 2021 uh, is fantastic. It's amazing how people come together. And I think technology has aided that as well. And we've been able to access leaders and experts from all around the world that have given us their time, that have given you the community and the listeners, uh, hopefully some valuable insights. And this is just the start. So we're booked out already until April, May next year. I think the experts we've got lined up for the next season are going to be fantastic. I don't want to give anything away yet, uh, but a special thanks to all the guests that we've had. Uh, we've made long lasting connections, networks and friends, and we appreciate all your help and support. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, Val. Um, and I guess all that's left to say to our listeners is, you know, Merry Christmas and have a fantastic new year. Merry Christmas. We will be uh, off off the air for a couple of weeks just to take a, a break. And I think a well-deserved one has been a hectic year, as you say. And then we'll catch up with everyone in the new year um, with some really exciting guests lined up, as, as you've mentioned. And also we have some perhaps some fresh ideas in terms of uh, what we'll be delivering. Um, so watch oh, yeah. the space um, and uh, rest up, I guess, and prepare for what we've got um, coming for you in the new year. Well, any final words you just want to leave our guests with? Just want to thank all the subscribers and listeners. I think, you know, we've we've hit a huge milestone in the last month. 10,000 downloads this is our 50th episode, uh, end of season two. When we started this out, Dale, I don't think you and I ever realized it would be this big, this fast and this serious because uh, we're quite immature when it comes to <laughs> things like this. Too many so things. <laughs> anyone anyone who listens to the back catalog you'll be like what are these clowns doing um we are morons but we are passionate about our profession and all i can say is hopefully you got lots of info into information sorry intel and inspiration and in the in the future please feedback is welcome we yeah. we love all our communities and thanks for your support it, it's been fantastic agreed agreed so folks that is all the time we have for this episode and this season and this year um, but it doesn't have to stop here support our charities and access blogs and provide us feedback at projectchatterpodcast.com don't forget to hit subscribe on our youtube channel and your podcast player so you don't miss the next one well thanks for an amazing season um it's Thank you. been it's been great and thanks to all of you for listening to us till next time we say stay safe be disruptive and have fun doing it. From me and Val, it's bye for now.